have to say this on the channel because honestly, I thought it was a given, but transition is hard, like really hard. In fact, it's never quite as easy as we might think it is when first contemplating making a big change in our lives. It doesn't matter if it's the transition to a personal journey to one's true self, moving homes, switching careers, or perhaps just getting used to a new work schedule, workout routine, or diet. It's never quite as easy as you want and think it will be. Seemingly out of the blue, we're facing a pretty major transition in the electric vehicle world in North America as automakers and charging providers are suddenly coming out in support of Tesla's charge connector, self-described by Tesla as NAX, or the North American Charging Standard, in preference to the existing ratified industry standard of CCS. And while there are some who are confused and frustrated about this seemingly sudden announcement and others who are cheering the auto industry on for the decision, today we're going to be focusing on, based on the information available to us at the point of filming, what's going to need to happen in order for this transition to be a smooth one and for it not to end up a complete mess. And if there's one thing we know about here at the channel, it's successful transitions. <clears throat> Before I get too far into today's video, a little disclaimer, because I know if I don't do it, someone who may or may not be named Bob, Mark or Denise will get all upset in the comments section about us filming and publishing this with information missing that wasn't actually available when we hit record. I am recording this on the 13th of June at about 4.30 in the afternoon, and you're probably watching it a few days later, by which point, what with this being a breaking news story, there may be extra elements we can't foretell. In keeping with our standards of editorial impartiality, Transport Evolved would like to clarify that other names do exist. The names Bob, Mark and Denise were chosen wholly at random, and please know that we are neither expressing support for nor against people with those names, and that possession of a particular name, say for example Mark, does not mean that you behave in a particular way in our comments section. With the disclaimers out of the way, let's look at what we know so far. It started a few weeks back when Ford surprised everyone by announcing it would be including NAX charging ports on all electric vehicles made from 2025 onwards. Noticeably, it did not say that it would be removing CCS, but rather that it would, quote, equip future EVs with the NAX charge port, end quote. Ford also confirmed it would be making an adapter in collaboration with Tesla that would make it possible for existing Ford customers to use the physical NAX-based Tesla V3 superchargers on cars that were not built with NAX from the factory, aka cars with the current standard CCS Type 1. The announcement was made late on a Thursday afternoon during a Twitter Spaces conversation between Tesla CEO and Twitter owner Elon Musk and Jim Farley, CEO of Ford. Then, just last week, General Motors CEO Mary Barra, in a similar Twitter Spaces livestream with Musk, announced all GM brands would do the same, with a similar plan for making an adapter for existing customers to use to access supercharger sites. In both of these cases, there's been little information from either Ford or General Motors on exactly how this will all work. Remember that in its own paperwork detailing NAX, Tesla details the physical characteristics of the inlet, but does not go into great detail about how the actual charging and communication happens, other than to say, quote, use CCS, and in this instance, it means the CCS protocol not the CCS Type 1 connector. Tesla has also not discussed publicly anything about this announcement in terms of how the handshake between the charging station and the vehicle will work. It's possible that Tesla will give Ford, GM and anyone else wanting to use the standard access to its own proprietary communication protocols, 
or it may be reliant on the CCS plug and charge standard, more formally a section of ISO 15118, but without any official commitment on this, we're in the dark at the time of filming. We think it's most likely that Ford and GM will make this a physical connector change, not a communication protocol change, at least as we're filming right now. And again, just to remind you, in the video we made earlier this year with the lovely Jeremy Whaling from EVGo, link just here, you'll learn that there are a whole slew of different charging protocols and languages that are transmitted between the car and the charge station. Also up in the air at this time is just which older Ford and GM vehicles will be supported. While it's not been explicitly mentioned, the announcement from Ford and GM seems to revolve around their own implementations of plug and charge. That, for those who don't know, is a technology that allows EV customers to automatically authenticate their car and thus add their billing information just by plugging in to charge at a compatible plug and charge station. But some of the earliest electric vehicles from Ford and GM are now 10 or more years old, and it's likely they won't be capable of using NAC stations, even with an adapter, unless there's some special clever technology at play we don't yet know about, because they don't have plug and charge. There's also some confusion as to if early Chevrolet Bolt EVs, for example, will even be compatible. And because I want to stay on target here, we'll loop back to this a little later in the video. With Ford and GM committed to NAX, although again, very little from either in terms of concrete signed agreements as far as we can tell, meaning there's still negotiations ahead of them, EVGo, ABB, Blink, ChargePoint, Flow, Tritium and Wallbox have all announced their intent this week to expand and or add NAX compatibility to their respective charging networks and or charge stations. And this morning, remember, I'm filming this on a Tuesday, Charin, the international organisation responsible for developing the CCS standard and pushing for a global homogeneity in EV charging, said that it would help Tesla make NAX into a proper, ratified, recognised standard. Although, again, at the time of filming, Tesla hasn't responded because that's not how Tesla rolls. And likely because Sharin has criticised Tesla in the past for refusing to get NAX established as an approved standard or to use CCS Type 1. And yes, there's a lot of politics at play here. A whole bunch of politics. And anyone who tells you otherwise is doing themselves and others a massive disservice. Oh, and before I leave the state of affairs section, let's just note that Electrify America, the largest competitor to Tesla's supercharger network right now, hasn't responded as far as we know to the NAX switch, although some of its suppliers like Tritium and ABB have. Next up, how did we get here? How did we suddenly see so many companies jump on Tesla's bandwagon? As I surmised in a recent video on Ford's announcement, bing, Ford has been closely watching public charging station reliability in North America and no network other than Tesla is even close to the uptime and availability requirements needed for a smooth transition to EVs. But there are also some other thoughts here. The first one is that the US is not above protectionist measures to try and give its own companies from the US a bit of a leg up. Ford and GM are both US brands, and they're the first ones to jump in bed with Tesla on NAX. Foreign automakers like Volkswagen, Mercedes-Benz, Audi, BMW, Hyundai, Kia and Genesis, among others, all remain quiet. That is at the point of filming, though that may have changed by the time you watch this. And it makes me wonder if this shift could cause larger rifts in the auto industry, especially as Europe has for a long time mandated that all automakers adopt the CCS Type 2 standard for their fast charging stations and connectors. Which is why, by the way, it is so much easier to charge EVs in Europe compared to North America, because even Teslas use the same connectors as everyone else. For Volkswagen Group, it's spectacularly awkward, given that Electrify America is its penance for massively polluting vehicles produced during Dieselgate. And for other European marks like Mercedes-Benz and BMW, it's also 
challenging as they're part of Ionity, EA's European equivalent. Switching to NAC's connector in the US for all of these companies is politically very difficult, as it might be taken as implying that CCS is problematic. Then again, Ford is also part of Ionity, so... Heh. Then, there's the lure of government funding. The current US administration regardless of what you think about it. And by now I know that there is a slew of different political alignments who watch this channel. The government spent a lot of time working on promoting the transition to cleaner energy and transportation solutions. And this includes massive renewable energy programs and electric car charging networks. But in order to be eligible for US federal funding, several things need to happen. First, charging networks need to support all currently used charging standards. And the requirements explicitly cite CCS. The network must also offer a predictable and reliable experience to all customers. Second, networks must have a single method of identification and payments across all charging stations and must support future facing technologies like plug and charge. Finally, and I should note there are other requirements too, but I'm not going to go into them here. The networks need to achieve at least 97% uptime in order to be eligible for federal funding. There are plenty of charging networks out there who may be able to reach the first two requirements, but the third is something that right now only Tesla can achieve. And automakers would rather someone else build out networks for them, so by partnering with Tesla and making it easier for Tesla to receive federal funding, it does seem like a win-win for automakers. But again, not necessarily for customers, which I will come to in a moment. So the transition is happening, but how do we get from where we are today to a future with NAX. First, let's talk about the actual existing charging infrastructure. While some charging stations will undoubtedly just be capable of being switched to NAX with a physical cable change, it's also likely that there will be some kind of underlying need for software changes to be made somewhere in the system to take into account the NAX connector, especially for stations that currently do not support plug and charge. And that, by the way, is a huge number of CCS charging stations across North America. And don't just think it's major charging networks either. Granted, while the majority of public fast chargers are now owned and operated by a few large corporations, there are still plenty of fast charging stations that are owned by small utility companies, community organizations, and independent businesses. They're often lower powered units, like 50 kilowatts, in more remote locations, but they're also often the ones that can make a difference between an awkward road trip across a cross country pass and a pleasant one. Let's not forget either that while some charging companies lease the land that their charging stations are located on, and they pay the landowners a portion of the profits from charging. Other providers sell businesses the hardware and then charge them a nominal service fee to keep them running and operational, passing on all of the profits minus a cut of the earnings. And it's those mum and pop independent charging stations that are going to need financial assistance to make the change to NAX, or at least to implement NAX, because without financial support to make sure that their charging stations support it, they could be left with a very expensive charging station on their property that they're still paying for, but which is now effectively obsolete. And they could be left without the custom they once had from EV drivers. As anyone who was an early adopter of the Nissan Leaf will tell you, charging stations that originally popped up, often in rural areas, to just support Chademo cars like the Nissan Leaf and Mitsubishi Aimeev, quickly became unloved and unreliable when the rest of the industry went to CCS. And in order for this transition to NAX to happen smoothly, we as an industry cannot allow that same thing to happen again just a few years after the great Chidemo die out. 
Moreover, a charging station sitting unloved and unused is a terrible message to send non-EV drivers and reinforces the very commonly shared fear, uncertainty and doubt about the viability and practicality of EV travel. And with this being the second time this has happened in a decade, it could even put some business owners off EV infrastructure and EV ownership forever because they have no concrete proof that what the new standard is will remain the new standard for decades to come. And this is very different to the humble gas pump, which, while it's become more sophisticated over time in its operation, is still basically the same nozzle arrangement it's been since the very first hand pump stations started to pop up across the world after auto industry engineers and chemists agreed on the actual chemical makeup of gasoline. Subsidised retrofitting is essentially what we need, but retrofitting all of those charging stations is also going to cost a lot of money. Sure, it may be cheaper than putting in brand new charging stations, but it's still going to be expensive. And the question of who pays for this all is still very much up in the air. For what it's worth, it's either going to be the auto industry, the government or customers actually using the stations and buying the cars. I'm guessing it will be the customers. Of course, if we're going to see a large number of charging stations going to NACs, we should also look at Tesla to agree that it won't suddenly change anything about NACs without first going through a proper committee ratification process, which I honestly think is one of the reasons that Shirin wants to help Tesla make NACs a real boy. Tesla will need to put this in writing and sign an agreement that will essentially make all NACs-related information and IP completely public domain. And that includes the payment for charging and the communication protocols. If not, we're going to be in a similar situation to that seen in the past with Apple, which has a very nasty reputation for suddenly changing how things work and causing equipment manufacturers to scramble to issue fixes and patches or even just scrap entire products worth millions because Apple decided it wanted to do things different. It's one thing to do that with a mobile phone worth a few hundred bucks, but a car worth tens of thousands? That's not so easy to overcome or swallow. Don't think it's not happened to date either. When Tesla began making its cars compatible with CCS and floated the idea of making a CCS to NACS adapter for North America and Korean customers to use to actually charge their Teslas at CCS Type 1 stations, plenty of third-party companies jumped on. Tesla, not wanting customers to use adapters other than its official CCS to Tesla one, regularly tweaked supercharger software and in-car software to ensure that anyone who purchased one of these more affordable adapters made by third parties was left frustrated more than they were charged up. And we know this because we once had one of these adapters to review and every time a new software was pushed by the adapter manufacturer, Tesla would retaliate with a software update which broke it again. Winter and I tried to review it for three straight weeks and we just gave up. And while we're on the subject of legalese, given persistent allegations that Elon Musk is willing to renege on contractual obligations at his various companies, we think there needs to be an ironclad way to ensure that Tesla, or rather Elon Musk, can't suddenly change their mind and screw one or multiple manufacturers over, well, some arbitrary reason. Because again, if that were to happen, it would push back the adoption of EVs years. In addition to all of that, we also want to see a commitment from Tesla and those joining it on the NAX journey to make the schematics of a CCS to NAX adapter available to any company that wishes to make one, along with proper engineering standards and tests for compliance. Basically, it needs to be so easy to make and sell these because that's how we're going to get as many people charging using NAX as possible. If indeed, the transition occurs, which it does now look as if it will. Ideally, given the number of Chidemo cars around, we'd also love to see a Chidemo to Nax adapter, but that is far less likely. There also needs to be a lot of communication work from all parties involved in this. There will be issues arising from the network transition, and there will be compatibility issues. 
The main reason Tesla's supercharger network is so hassle-free is because Tesla controls the cars, the charging stations, and the communication between them both. When other parties come on board, there will be headaches and there will be incompatibilities. And every automaker and every charging manufacturer who steps on boards needs to be ready to answer tough questions when that happens, just like many of them don't do right now. But basically assuming that it's going to be plain sailing just because everyone is using a different physical connector is very dangerous and apt to lead to disappointment. Remember, it is right now just a charging connector difference, nothing else. At least it is for most people because in the early days of Tesla's Nax connector, Tesla did use a different protocol for charging early Model S, X and 3s that may have not had the official upgrade to enable them to use CCS. And that means that those cars may not be able to use NACs based non-Tesla charging stations if those stations just use CCS protocols to communicate with the car, as we and most people in the industry seem to think they will. In that case, while they'll be able to physically plug in, charging won't start, leading to even more confusion. With all of that out of the way though, let's look at some of the final considerations that need to be taken into account if the transition to NAX occurs. And remember, we're not aware of any legal agreements yet between any party, so we're really at a very little more than agreements in principles from all involved. First, this transition will slow down EV sales for the next few years because nobody but nobody will want to buy a new electric car in North America if there is any confusion over which charging connectors will become the dominant one, which means that I hope we'll see a quick standardization and ratification of NACs, as that is what we need if it's going to become the new standard of choice. Next, if NAX does become the standard, companies reliant on 800 volt architecture are going to be pushing Tesla and other charging station manufacturers hard to roll out what Tesla refers to as V4 superchargers. At present, US superchargers are all what Tesla refers to as V3, and they are only capable of 250 kilowatts at 400 volts. That means they are incapable of supplying the 800 volts that's enabled Porsche, Lucid, and Hyundai Kia to develop ultra rapid charging. And side note, at last check, the only V4 supercharger in the wild, which is in Hardwick in the Netherlands, was still capped at 250 kilowatts, although it does allow up to a thousand volts. Also, to help ensure customers do continue to buy cars, automakers need to do more than just commit to compatibility looking forward. They need to make hardware available free of charge to each and every customer from now on to the point of the change. Even with that, however, it is likely that many first time buyers will be put off because as the history books show, standard wars always leave casualties. This will also make the value of existing cars far lower and perhaps make it harder for them to sell on the used market. I've already seen people discuss their preference to hold out for a few more years with their existing gas guzzlers until this is better cemented. Some of you in comments to videos on this channel. And frankly, I can't blame them. But in a world where anthropogenic climate change is accelerating and we humans continue to increase our annual carbon emissions, we don't have the luxury to fudge around. A V2G is likely also going to get delayed too, because while NAX is theoretically capable of V2G, it's not yet part of Tesla's NAX protocol or roadmap. And again, V2G is a key factor in allowing communities and power companies to prepare for a climactically uncertain future where power cuts and natural disasters are more common and democratized distributed generation and energy storage is essential. Finally, this could temporarily push the price of new EVs up, not down. While economies of scale will ultimately do the opposite, automakers who have already committed to supplies of CCS will have to underwrite the cost of going to NAX, either in addition to CCS, as we believe Ford and GM are contemplating for a while, or as a replacement to CCS. And sadly, that expense will ultimately be passed on to the customers. And that's before you account for the extra 
physical hardware needed to handle the internal switching hardware required in NACS compatible cars to ensure that DC power is sent directly to the battery pack while AC power is sent to the onboard charging circuits. In case you're not aware, CCS standards use separate cables for high and low voltage charging, while NACS uses the same physical pins and a relay system to send power to the right place within the car. So there you have it, our take on making a successful transition to NACS. There will be hiccups along the way, and yes, even Tesla will need to expand its charging network by a huge percentage to accommodate all of those extra cars. Although. As we've said before, the more networks that join in, the better, because nobody likes a monopoly except the one running it. And on that note, we are done with today's video. If you have comments, drop us a polite note in the Discord chat room, on Mastodon in the comments below, or if you are a Patreon supporter in the comments there. If you want more, subscribe, hit the bell, and follow the links below to regularly support us with a YouTube membership or Patreon subscription. You'll also find links to our Ko-fi, Bitcoin, and Swag store, as well as that aforementioned Mastodon server. Scrolling on my right is the list of amazing charged up supporters, and shout outs go out to our V2G Patreon supporters, Pedro Mora Pinchero, Alan Tupper, Andrew Martin, Bennett Eld, Brophy Wolf, Chris Maxwell, Cyprian Laplace, Dan Blair, Gordon C, Hey Asker, John Tramal, Carl Fox, Mark Eggleton, Peter Dillinger, Ray Jean Fellows, Sean Tucker, Stefan Fremgen, Stephen Williams, Tazla in the Gong, Paul Bricknell, Tony Moss, Carl Hodgson, Chris Asentar, Denny Hyde, Lance Schlarl, Linda Irish, Mike Weeder, and Paul Nelson. And finally, big thanks to our off grid supporters Paul Conway, Kevin Burrowbridge, Stephen O'Donoghue, Jim Burness, Robert Flannery, Aaron Hahn, Ellery Hensley, Rory Litwin. JP Fagerback, Dave Kitchen, Andrew Glenn, Anonymous Freak, Chris and Michael Johnson, Clay Witt, CPU Freak 101, Eric Knack, Joe Bresney, Joe Hughes, John Henderson, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Drobnak, Nigel S, Reggie Watts, Oil Graylin, and of course, Ian. Don't forget that we make videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday and Saturday on this channel, a day earlier if you are a Patreon or YouTube channel member. Plus, on a Sunday, you will find our chicken and garden updates and Sunday musings over on Take Two. And with that, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you soon. And as always, keep evolving.